hello. The purpose of this shear, of this get together now for the next uh, hopefully about 20 minutes, is to try to give a brief overview of how manageable Pesach preparation really is. Uh, this year, especially uh, with this uh, great uncertainty surrounding COVID 19, many people who hadn't been planning to make Pesach find themselves very close to Pesach, having a need to now make Pesach. And uh, it can be overwhelming, especially because there's this uh, mystique, or I should say this cloud that surrounds Pesach, that you can't possibly make Pesach unless you start preparing uh, somewhere between Hanukkah and Tu uh, That's not the case. And we have a couple of weeks to Pesach, and we're going to be just fine. So I want to just sh share with you four principles uh, to think about as you make Pesach, four Pesach preparation principles that can make all the difference in how this preparation process goes and will make you realize how manageable it is to prepare for Pesach in the amount of time that we have ahead of us. First, there's a rule which is taught, and that is that Mokom She'en Machis and Bochometz Ein Tzorach when we talk about preparing the house for Pesach, and much of our discussion, I'm not going to be speaking to you tonight about the specific preparations of the kitchen. I'm talking about preparing the house for Pesach primarily, and a little bit about the preparation of the kitchen. A place where chametz is not introduced does not require checking for chametz. Now, what is a place where chametz is introduced? There could be many, many areas in the house where chametz are introduced in houses with young children especially. There are places where all kinds of places where chametz might be introduced. But there has to be a reality to the chance that chametz is introduced there, a reality of something of a meaningful possibility. So for example, in the Gemara it speaks about when a person has a wine cellar that they go to, and it's the kind of wine cellar that they would go to in the middle of the meal, holding a piece of bread to replenish to get another bottle of wine. That's a place which requires Bedita to see if there's no bread there. However, there are areas where you never would go with a piece of bread. So there could be a wine cellar that you don't go to in the middle of a meal. Or you may know that your habit would never be to go downstairs or to go to that part with a piece of bread. So the classic places where we have to think about this are the rooms of the house other than the kitchen, and specifically people's bedrooms their closets, their drawers, their armoires. In that image of Pesach, the impossible Pesach, one has to go through everything. But in truth, there are large parts of our homes where they are simply places where chametz would really never be introduced. A clothing closet, an armoire, a dresser. Does, does, does food ever go there? Do we ever put food in those places? Now it is true, you may have once tucked an energy bar into your jacket pocket or into a, a pants pocket or something like that, and it could be there. And the halacha is you should go check those pockets. You check pockets of clothing where food might have been placed. So a person might know that sometimes they place food in their jacket. Sometimes they place food in this kind of pocket. They may know that they never place food in their shirt pocket or their blouse pocket or something like that, so they wouldn't have to check there. And just because they might have some chametz in the pocket of one of their jackets, it doesn't mean that they have to check the entire closet in which that jacket, jacket is found. Because if they know that if they have shelves, sweaters, or areas where shirts are hanging, chametz just doesn't go there. And if they're not someone who will go into the closet while eating breakfast and holding something and eating, so then that may simply be a place, she'en machisim bo chametz, where chametz isn't, isn't entered, isn't introduced. That's certainly true of the drawers. So that's principle number one. Identify the many, many areas in your house, in the rooms around your house, which are simply places that chametz is not introduced. And those places do not require the dikas chametz. You don't have to check for chametz there, and therefore you don't have to clean for chametz there. That's principle number one, which eliminates a whole bunch of the cleaning items from your list. Principle number two. In halacha, it doesn't really speak about cleaning for Pesach. It speaks about checking for chametz for Pesach. 
there's no real halacha to clean. The halacha is to inspect, to make sure that chametz isn't there. So let's look at the rest of that room, that bedroom perhaps, where chametz might sometimes be introduced because maybe you lie in your bed and you have a midnight snack. Maybe you have a breakfast in bed or one day you weren't feeling so good, so you ate you know, some toast and tea in your bed. So it's a place truly where chametz was introduced and you have to check to make sure that chametz isn't there. But checking to make sure that chametz isn't there does not necessarily mean at all that you have to take apart the bed and the box spring, move it out, that you have to shampoo the carpets. What you have to do is you have to inspect. You have to look to see if there's chametz there. Where could there be chametz? Where might the chametz have fallen? It could have fallen something behind the bed. So you get down and you look with a flashlight and you see, is there anything under there? Is there any chametz there? Not dust, but chametz. So here again, this is a second critical principle. You don't have to clean, you have to inspect. If you have, for example, toys that a child uses, so the child perhaps eats, could eat while using the toys. Those toys don't have to be washed and bleached. Oh, it's true. Many people do that. Many people do that in normal years. They'll take the time to do that, whether it's necessary or not, whether it's advised or not. But perhaps that's one of the expressions of Yirash Shemayim, of fear of heaven and preparing for Pesach. But this Pesach, especially for those who are either making Pesach when they didn't plan to, or making Pesach with a lot more stress and maybe a lot more people underfoot and so on and so forth than they plan to, it is very important that we do what we have to, not that we necessarily go above and beyond. And so if you want to check those games, yeah. So you make an activity, you sit down, you choose the games you're going to be using on Pesach, and you take a look at them. You look and see, is there any, are there any crushed cupcakes in, in these pieces of Lego? I don't see any. It's good. It's fine. It's now okay for Pesach. The areas, again, around the place, they don't necessarily have to be washed top to bottom. Our dining room chairs don't have to be blowtorched, <laughs> but rather all we have to do is we have to look. We have to look in the cracks, look in the crevices, see that there's nothing there. If there's nothing there, then Ain't sarich. There's no need for anything more. There's no halacha of cleaning. There's halacha of checking. There's halacha of checking. So again, other times, other years, more time, we might do more things, but let's talk about what's required. So in principle number one, there are entire areas, cabinets, filing cabinets, who knows what, areas of the house, which are places where Hamid simply isn't introduced. Those places do not need to be checked or cleaned for Pesach. Even areas where chametz is introduced, aside from a kitchen where there's a whole different set of halachas, but areas even where chametz is introduced, could have been introduced, we have to inspect them to make sure that there's no chametz there. There's no halacha of massively cleaning them, just checking and looking carefully. Following this formula, I think you understand that checking any bedroom in the house could probably be done, preparing any bedroom in the house for Pesach could probably be done in five minutes, perhaps 10. What would you have to do? All you'd have to do is see where in this room we would actually have brought food, and that would probably narrow it down to a couple of spots. So maybe you have some pockets in the closet to look at. Maybe you have a drawer where you might have stored something, and the area around your bed where you might have eaten or areas like that where you might have carried food. And then you just take a quick look, you inspect, you see, you check with a flashlight and you'll see. And then that area is done. You might find some items, maybe a perfume or something that you want to put away where you sell the chametz. Okay, that would be another thing to put on the checklist. But between those two principles, a great deal is resolved and makes things much, much easier. You don't have to check a place where chametz isn't introduced, and you don't have to clean. You just have to check. Principle number three, or actually this is not so much a principle, but rather a method, a method of reducing the obligation. This is one which is used and must be used in one's kitchen, but can be used all over the house. We do something called the sale of chametz, and the sale of chametz 
is something which will be done this year as well, although it will be done a little bit differently since it can't be done in person. The rabbis are expect, accepting being appointed to be a shliach, to be an agent to sell the chametz by email or by telephone, by different methods. And then they sell the chametz. When they sell the chametz, not only do they sell the actual chametz items, but they'll also sell the areas where that chametz is kept. And they can also include other areas where there may not be jars of, of flour or noodles or whatever it is that, that, that one wants to sell as chametz, but jars full of cabinets full of dishes, of pots and pans that really, according to the strict halacha, if you kept them, you'd have to check them to make sure there was no real chametz there. But here what you can do is close the cabinet, put the tape across the cabinet, include that cabinet in the sale, you don't have to check anything in there. Just whatever is behind these doors is going to be sold, or in the case of dishes, many rabbis like myself will just rent the dishes so that there's no question of having to total those dishes when they get back. So close the cabinet, and we don't have to go there. So there might be places where chametz might go. So here, let's take choose an example. Your children have many, many toys in a toy closet. You want to go through that whole thing for Pesach, but they need toys. So we sit down with them and we say, okay, choose five games, five toys that we want to have out for Pesach. You choose those games and toys. You sit on the floor, you have a 20-minute activity where you look through them and you see that there's no comments in there. Fantastic. These are the toys that are out for Pesach. The rest of the toy closet, tape across it, close it included in the sale of chametz. You don't have to look to see if anything's there. It'll be included in the sale of chametz. That room where you have boxes of things and you say, oh, we moved three years ago, but I never checked to make sure that there was never anything there. There may be other reasons why you probably don't have to check for chametz there. But even if you think it's a place where chametz was introduced, but it's a room or an area or a closet or a corner of a room that you don't have to use, close it up, drape something over it, included in the sale of chametz, and you will have saved yourself that space. This is an idea which enters your kitchen as well, as we mentioned before. Choose, you didn't prepare for Pesach, take out what you'll be able to use. You're gonna have your, your, your areas where you're gonna keep your disposable plates, where you're gonna keep your few Pesach pots, the other Pesach items, close up everything else. You don't have to move stuff to the basement, you don't have to move stuff to the attic, just as much as possible, just close the stuff in place, clear for yourself surfaces or a, a, or a one cabinet or two where you can put the stuff or leave the things that you're going to have that's going to be ready for Pesach and everything else just close up in place and include it in the sale of chametz. That's a third piece. Number one, you don't have to check places where chametz doesn't go. Number two, you don't have to clean those areas generally. You just have to inspect them to make sure there's no chametz there. And number three, close off areas that you won't really need, that you're not going to use. Rather than cleaning them, rather than moving things around, just close off the areas, include them in the sale of chametz. And you could get the bulk, the by far the bulk of your house done, put away, ready for Pesach in a very, very short amount of time. Now, as we said before, the one caveat on this is that when you're talking about kitchen appliances, kitchen counters, kitchen sinks, areas which are going to be used with food, there much more attention is needed. And there, the cashering process as described in the many resources which are available need to be used, need to be invoked. But so many of these areas can be removed. I would also note, because many people ask this question, it's the, was the Hanhaga, the custom, of many, many, many great people not to check all their books for chametz. You should look over the bookshelf to make sure that no, no, nobody stuck anything there, but you don't have to go through the books page by page. Books which are brought to the table during the year and are brought to the table on Pesach, that's an issue. Those should be gone through more carefully, lest crumbs uh, that are of any kind of meaning fall out. They should be gone through more carefully. But books which aren't brought to the table, now, Hugga, the custom of many great Gedol Yisrael was not to, 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 uh, to check through them. So those are three principles. What's the fourth principle? The fourth principle is the principle of Simchas Yom Tev, of the joy of Yom Tev. The joy of Pesach, which is supposed to be central to the, to the Yom Tev, to the holiday. 
the joy of Pesach, which creates the warm feelings that surround the Igadatel of Incha giving over to our children. The warmth of Pesach, the good feeling that should surround our Pesach preparations. That's something which is critical and essential to the process. And creating a sense of there's so much that we have to do when there really isn't so much brings to us attention. I would like to suggest to everyone every year, but especially this year, that if there's one thing that we want to have, Lamahadrin, in the greatest and most beautiful and plentiful measure, it is the joy of Yom Tov. It's a time when we need it. And if we're able to relax and understand how attainable preparing for Yom Tov is, when we're able to relax and understand that everyone's going to be fine without all the different varieties of things that we have in other years, but we can put aside the stress of having to make a meal fit for a king for who knows how many guests, but instead make for ourselves a beautiful, regular, sort of like a Pesach Diga Shabbos. That'll be our Seder, that'll be our family time, that'll be memorable and joyous. Always keep our eyes on the prize. To have peace, to have joy in our homes, may indeed, through this period, this period of challenge and of difficulty, may we be able to maintain that joy by doing what we need to do, what we need to do, not more, not more, just what we need to do. I hope this is somewhat helpful for you, and I hope it helps all of us so we can, as Hashem, be able to celebrate a truly joyous, healthy, strong Yom Tov Pesach coming up. Thank you.